welcome everybody. Thank you all for being here. Who is excited to learn about Podman and Podman Desktop? <laughs> Woo! All right, awesome. Um, right on the uh, right on the time here, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, many thanks to you guys volunteering and helping organize, and everyone here. This is my first Dev Comp, first time I've ever been in Brno for sure. Um, uh, and I'm really happy to be here and, and talk all about the flow of going from containers, working with applications on our local machine, to translating those into pods and deploying them on both local and remote Kubernetes environments. Uh, and this is the special session because we're going to be talking about AI. AI, woo! Uh, yeah, <laughs> mixed reactions, it's OK. Um, so <laughs> did anyone come to the lightning talk earlier over there? OK, fantastic. Good to see you guys again. My name is Cedric Clyburn. I'm a developer advocate at Red Hat. I talk about all things uh, developer tooling and uh, Kubernetes and now AI. Um, so <laughs> today's schedule, we've got a lot to cover. Um, but briefly, I want to talk about um, in the conversations I have with customers that we work with, with developers in the community, uh, why you should care about Podman and why I care about Podman. So, uh, a large amount is because of the Docker desktop licensing changes that went about in 2021, 2022, where organizations essentially told their developers, you need to stop using Docker desktop, and they, you know, we need another alternative there. We need something that we can use that's free, open source, um, and that we can contribute to. So uh, another reason is also those large organizations want to be able to run containers and take advantage of container technology. Uh, but giving developers administrative access for usage with, say, Docker Desktop or uh, other container tooling is a big risk. But they want to take advantage of containers, and I, I understand. Maybe you don't need Kubernetes, but you want to be able to run containers in a production environment, be able to take advantage of systemd, and be able to uh, work with policies for uh, security and, and, and beyond. Um, maybe you want to learn about Kubernetes, right? It's all the hype right now, but you don't want to run a full cluster on your machine or pay for a cluster somewhere else but you want to be able to work with pods and deployments. Or maybe you want to have to use Docker and Podman and Lima all at the same time in one place and connect to your Kubernetes environments. But I think because we're all here at DevConf, the biggest reason why I think you should care about Podman is because the spirit and the power of the open source community and having a place for us all to contribute to and use open source software uh, and make technology better. So that's my little spill about why Podman is awesome and amazing. And we're going to see it live today in a really fun demo, uh, going through a little bit about Podman and then going to Podman Desktop, uh, showing a really cool demo to Kubernetes, and then also talking about how to integrate generative AI into your applications all in an open source way. So how many of us, raise your hand, are using Podman already? OK, sweet. So how many of us are uh, also using Podman Desktop? OK, sweet. So perfect. You're at the right talk. Don't worry. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and just in the interest of time and everything, I want to share these resources and slides that you can um, scan to get some more Podman and Podman Desktop slides. Maybe you're a Java developer. There's some guides there as well. Um, and you can consult these resources later. And I'll also have them at the end of the presentation. Uh, so without further ado, I want to talk quickly about Podman, do a little refresher before we hop into Podman Desktop. You've probably have seen the SILs. The SILs are the amazing mascots of the Podman project and Podman Desktop as well, because a group of SILs, like three, they're not SILs, they're Selkies. I got I to gotta fix that part. Selkies, a group of them, is known as a pod. And then uh, Podman's name is Pod Manager, managing pods. And pods are also the concept in Kubernetes that we'll be uh, working with for our application. And I'm not from the Sheck, but this is my interpretation of uh, if the if the Sills the Sheck uh, Selkies. Selkies, and they also have names. I don't know the names. All three of them. The daughters. Yes, I gotta do some education myself. Uh, of course, they got a nice pint of beer. They're flying in with Ryanair to the tiny Brno airport. Uh, and they're riding around on these little buses. I don't know how to describe them. Trams. We, we need that. <laughs> yeah, we need trams in the US. I'm going to talk. That's valid. That's valid. We don't have these in New York. Um, <laughs> so, 
We used to. I don't know what happened. I'll get on that. Um, Podman, the two things that you should know is that, uh, firstly, it's a very fast and light container engine to work with. Not only containers, but images, registries, volumes, and Kubernetes, as we'll see. Um, because of not having a daemon process that's managing our containers in the background, Podman essentially is just forking itself. That child process becomes a container, and you can manage that with System D. Woohoo! Um, but <laughs> in addition, since Podman came out in 2019, uh, it's been rootless by default, so you don't need elevated privileges in order to work with containers, which is really nice for large organizations. Of course, it's open source. You can go to github.com slash containers and view that organization to, to check out Podman, Podman Desktop, uh, Scopio, and all of the other really cool tools. Uh, and if you're familiar with Docker, a Docker build, a Docker run would be a Podman build, a Podman run based on that OCI, Open Container Initiative compliance uh, that lets us have formats for containers and images. Uh, and, and we'll also look at Docker Compose. I know that's you know, still a popular thing. Um, but using Podman in the CLI is fantastic, right? Uh, if you're on Mac or Windows, you're going to uh, use a Podman machine, which is a Fedora uh, VM running as containers are Linux. Uh, but you can build uh, containers from your source code. You can run them, SSH into them, debug them, export them to a pod. And then we'll see how Podman Desktop lets you take that to Kubernetes. Uh, and a quick refresher. Uh, images essentially wrap up our entire application um, into uh, a tarball and some JSON. Uh, we talked about that at the uh, keynote, which was really awesome. And we'll see how bootable containers integrates with Podman Desktop. The container is the running process of that application. And a pod is a series of one or more containers that we could take to Kubernetes. It's the most basic deployable unit. Um, and it's really easy to generate a Kubernetes YAML for a pod that we might have running on Podman. Uh, and this kind of brings up the question of, uh, well, you know, this is something new. I, I wasn't able to do this with Docker. Uh, and I quickly, really briefly, want to talk about the differences in architecture between these two container engines. Uh, when I started out development, I was using Docker Desktop. I didn't really understand what was going on under the hood. I would just build my images and run those containers. But what's actually happening is that Podman, um, uh, the architecture is a little bit different. It started about five years after Docker. And so what's happening when we do uh, and, and start a crea uh, the creation of a container is Podman is forking itself. Um, and that fork exec, that child process, then you works with the runtime in order to spawn the resources for our container uh, using all of the fun Linux um, uh, abilities like namespaces and cgroups. Uh, we also have Conmon there, which handles the logging of a container. Make sure that when you exit your container, those resources come back. But with Docker, while you might be working with the CLI in a rootless context, the daemon has elevated privileges by default. Uh, and so when it's actually managing and, and working with the containers uh, and using the same runtime, whether it's run C or C run, whatever it might be. But this is a big issue, say, if you're a system administrator, you want to be able to log and audit what's happening on your system. Well, the Podman architecture works with the audit subsystem in Linux so that you can see who is doing what with containers, what the containers are doing, uh, and what's happening inside of them. Versus when you're working with this big da uh, daemon process, it's much harder to understand what's happening, and this is a security risk. And if you want to learn more about this, there's two really smart guys up there. Uh, and if my manager is watching this, really uh, hardworking, hardworking engineers right there. So feel free to check that out. Uh, those are really good e explanation videos if you want to learn more. Um, and as my friend here says, there is more. So we'll look at this today. But if you're working with Compose spec, you can use those multi-container applications. Uh, you can bind the socket. So if you have a tool that works with the Docker socket, you can recreate that with the Podman socket and bind that. Uh, and Wasm. I don't know if anyone here is using Wasm. Um, but you can work with Wasm uh, applications and also take the advantage of con advantages of containers uh, and use both of those at the same time. And this brings us to the philosophy at Red Hat for why these container tools even exist. Because we have this strategy where we're thinking of things in an innovative uh, Swiss Army knife. So we have one tool for, for working with containers, and one tool for working with images, and one tool for registries. Uh, and so it's not just Podman and Podman Desktop, uh, but more container tools that you can take a look at. Um, and not just in development, but you can work with Podman for production environments, uh, integrating with Systemd with a really cool tool called Quadlet. Has anyone heard of that before? Uh, fantastic. I want to shout out uh, my friend Dan here. We're working on a new series called Red Hat Dan in Tech. Uh, and we just produced uh, an episode uh, two days ago on Quadlet uh, and working with Systemd in order to manage your containers. 
definitely check out the show. We're going to be talking more about um, uh, Podman and about those tools and also AI. Uh, Sally, we got to get you on the show. So uh, definitely recommend checking that out. Um, and so you could also work with auto updates. Say you're working in IoT environments, uh, in automotive, to be able to push up to a registry Podman auto update that image and roll back. So lots of features there. But this brings us to Podman Desktop. Uh, and just for my understanding, how many of us use Vim or Emacs? Either or. How many of us use Visual Studio Code or IntelliJ? OK, but wait, some people raised their hand twice. Um, <laughs> So essentially, the way I compare Podman Desktop with Podman is, you know, you sometimes like using the CLI and you sometimes like using a visual interface. Podman Desktop is the visual interface for Podman. Um, and it helps address a new problem that we're starting to see, which is uh, what's going on between local and production environments. So the way that we're building and running and testing our application, say on my local machine right here, is different and it lacks consistency Sorry, for the way we're, we're deploying applications in production on a Kubernetes or OpenShift cluster. Uh, so there's a lot of differences, the way that we're working with registries, with running containers in a root versus rootless fashion, uh, in the ways that we're working perhaps with Docker Compose, but that's not exactly translating to Kubernetes YAML. Uh, and there's a lot of additional complexity in the, uh, the resource requirements that I might have on my uh, local computer versus where I'm actually deploying the application. And that's in addition to a skills gap and a disconnect in between the dev and the operations team. And we kind of like to illustrate it with this beautiful graph that I didn't make myself. Um, but this is kind of the uh, adoption barrier to moving cloud native and one of the biggest challenges where I as a developer might be working in my inner loop. I might be working with base images with low to little security, with CVEs perhaps, uh, working with Docker Compose, which is great for uh, scaffolding my application. But taking that to Kubernetes is a di completely different format, right? Uh, and on the other side, when I give my artifact to the operations team, they have to work with their own curated base images. They're working in a completely rootless fashion for running containers. And they're working with Kubernetes YAML. And I might not have any idea how to create Kubernetes YAML. And this is an adoption barrier. Not only this, but if there's an issue in my production cluster, how do I recreate that on my local development environment? And you might be asking, what's the solution, Cedric? Well, I want to introduce to you Podman Desktop that we're going to see with the demo today. But it essentially builds on all of the strengths of Podman as a container engine to allow you to work with containers, to uh, translate those into pods, and to deploy onto local Kubernetes environments like Kind, Minikube, and OpenShift Local, and also deploy to remote services like my kubeconfig, any cluster there, or OpenShift, as we'll see uh, in the demo today. And so Podman Desktop keeps Podman up to date, it configures the machine for you if you're on window or Windows or Mac like I am today allows you to work with containers, pods, registries, you name it. Um, and uh, it's really nice because there's features to easily create a pod. Instead of having to do the command line for that and, and add in those containers, I can just create them from existing containers like that. Um, work with images and registries uh, to load those images into our local uh, Kubernetes clusters, like Kind and Minikube. Um, and to integrate with Kubernetes. So there's a whole dashboard for working with Kubernetes uh, to uh, allow you to connect to your kubeconfig and deploy there um, and automatically expose applications so that we can see them and test them. Uh, and this is all because of the cool extensions with Podman Desktop and the community. But without further ado, who's ready for a demo? <laughs> Woo! OK, fantastic. All right, so I have got um, uh, an, a sample two-tier application that we're going to see today. But also, I know there's a lot of Java developers here. so. I got you with the Quarkus application as well, I promise. Uh, we, we're going to cover everything today. Uh, firstly, I've downloaded Podman Desktop. Uh, there's podman.io and podman-desktop.io. You guys already know that. Um, but feel free to give a star to the Podman Desktop project. Uh, it's been over a year-ish. Um, nope. Sorry. It's been over a year-ish uh, since the GA came out for Podman Desktop 1. Um, and you know we would love your support. And feel free to put an issue or a PR in, uh, because that's the spirit of open source software. So I'm going to go ahead and show you uh, my Podman Desktop instance, which I don't have running. So let me start that up real quick. Um, of course, you got the cool uh, logo animation at the beginning. Um, and you'll see, as soon as I start Podman Desktop, we've got the Podman machine automatically running. I didn't have to do any configuration there. 
uh, as well as Docker compatibility and a learning center. So whether you're uh, a you know, Java developer, Python, whatever it might be, you can get started working with containers and Kubernetes. Um, there's the ability to work with your images here, to tag them, push them to registries, run your containers, uh, as I'll show you today, uh, and extensions like Docker desktop extensions, as well as two new extensions that were just added uh, about a month ago. So not only Podman AI Lab for working the Selkie Robot and Selkie Robot Shadows. Um, and uh, as we talked about today during the keynote, bootable containers, uh, you can use Podman Desktop to get started and, and create those um, Bootsy images from there. So I'll go ahead and start uh, and show you one last thing, uh, which is the catalog. So all of these items are extensions of Podman Desktop itself. If I want to bring in my Docker containers, there's a Docker extension. Uh, if I want to use Minikube, there's a Minikube extension. So it's very extensible. Um, but without further ado, I want to show you um, the example application that the first one that we're working with today. And I'm sorry if you were in the lightning talk. I'll re-show this really quickly. Um, but let me make this a little bit bigger. And I'll show you this is an example application uh, written in Python using Flask to essentially update a hit counter on this website that we're going to be deploying with our uh, containers. Uh, so super simple. We're connecting to a Redis instance um, that we, we might have running. We might not. Let's double check. So I'll do a Flask run. Uh, and this is one of the cool things about containers is that even if I don't have Redis installed on my machine, which we should see an error that we couldn't connect to Redis, we also don't have the environment variable, uh, I could easily uh, spin this up in a container, whether it's Redis, MongoDB, Postgres, or my application in a container, which is really nice, and we'll be doing that here. Um, we've also got a nice little Docker file. It's multi-stage. We're working with the universal base image for Red Hat Enterprise Linux, uh, building the application, creating a non-root user, uh, and then using a scratch image to copy that all in um, and start an entry point. And I want you to pay attention to this entry point because this is kind of one of the big differences I like to explain between containers and pods is that if we're working in a container, we have to network. And there's another Podman networking talk at the same time. But um, essentially, we have to work with IP addresses or ports uh, and connect these containers to each other. Pods talk to each other on localhost. So when we create this into a pod, we're going to be using uh, localhost to connect to our application. Um, instead of doing, for example, uh, a podman uh, and, and building our application, we can just use the, C the UI, which is really neat. So we could work with the registries that we might already be connected to, or just build it from source code. So I'll go ahead and navigate to the container file um, here. Sorry, don't, don't look at what I named it. Look away, look away. And I'll um, name it for my registry. So key or quay, however you like to pronounce it. Uh, and we can select a platform. So just like that, all those steps in the Docker file are being executed. Uh, and we're building our new image for this Python app. And just like that, we've tagged it. Didn't have to leave Podman Desktop. Really neat. And we've got this new image right here to be able to look at the different layers uh, and be able to start it. Um, now, the other thing that I'll do is, uh, since I showed you we need to have Redis running, I've actually already built and tagged both of the images for both this Python app and the Redis app uh, and tagged them and pushed them to a registry. So I've got both of them here. The back end is just Redis, but on top of the universal base image. So you have all those same uh, certifications and security. Um, and I'll go ahead and start that. And so this is the kind of starting place for working with a container. Uh, me and Dan had this phony discussion earlier about you know, are you a person who likes to work with toggles, or are you a CLI person? Uh, Podman might be if you enjoy just working with the commands. Podman Desktop is if you like to be interactive with it. Um, this is the Redis backend, so I'll give it a name. We can also work with mounting volumes, uh, port mapping, environment variables, uh, policies for restarting containers if they stop, uh, and networking and security like set comp profiles. Um, but all I have to do to get this Redis instance running is just start the container. We've got the logs there. I could SSH into my machine or into my container. Uh, I've got a Kubernetes manifest. And this is really simple, but it's going to get more fun uh, as we keep going. And I, I can inspect the manifest of this running container, which I'll do here in order to manually connect the back end Redis instance to the front end, the Python instance. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and start that up here. So here I'll give it a name of Python for the front end. 
on Mac, port 5000 is used for AirDrop. It's really frustrating. It took me a minute to learn that. Um, so uh, I'll, it automatically reroutes that to an available uh, port for me, which is really neat. And I'll go ahead and start this front end application. So we gave it the information to connect to our Redis database. And just like that, we've got our two tier application running in the browser. Very neat, very nice. Um, and this is really fun. But don't worry if you also use Docker Compose, because I want to show you uh, the ability to work with the Compose spec. So it's a part of Podman Desktop that allows you to work with Compose files. And so let me go to the containers here, and I'll do a Podman Compose up. And so just like that, we've got this Doom WASM port right here uh, that started up in a new Compose instance. So uh, now, for the rest of the session, just kidding, um, but we can play. <laughs> Uh, Doom, uh, which, you know, there's that meme about being able to play Doom on anything. So uh, this is another extension of that. So um, that's the ability to work with Compose. What about multi-container applications inside of a pod? How do we translate this to Kubernetes? Uh, what's neat is that if I have one container or multiple containers, all I have to do to create a pod is use this feature called Podify. So I'll give it a name, and you'll notice that it's replicating the two containers we have. And we don't have the exposed port of that Redis instance. That's because it's in this uh, single unit of a pod, and they can talk to each other on localhost, which is really neat. So now I've stopped those two containers, and I have one running pod. We can see the logs here, and we can open this up. And now the hit counter is refreshed. Containers are ephemeral. Um, and we've got this running inside of a pod. So it's really neat because we can see the Kubernetes manifest that, was, uh, that we have for this application. We've got that back end. Uh, and we've got the front end here, as well as any other parameters that we are working with for this application. So this is really neat. And we've done all of this within Podman Desktop. But I want to show you some really cool features uh, that allow us to test our application before deploying to a production environment. How many of us have used uh, Kind or Minikube before? OK, fantastic. So it's a great way to spin up a local Kubernetes instance. Uh, Minikube might take a little bit longer, so I'll do this with Kind. Um, and this allows us to uh, set up a uh, Kubernetes cluster inside of a container. We're working with Kubernetes 1.27.3, uh, setting up a control plane. And we'll be able to deploy our pod that we have on Podman Desktop into this cluster, test things out, and make sure everything's running successfully. Uh, so this is now running in Podman Desktop and on our machine. So if I do a kubectl, uh, we can see that we have access here uh, to this little Kubernetes instance, which is really fun. I'll go back to this pod, right? We've got this running locally. And I'm going to show you. This might blow your mind. We just deploy this pod to the local Kubernetes instance through the kube config that we have here. Uh, and we can create a new service for it so we can access it. Uh, and just like that, we're taking the Kubernetes manifest that we have there on the top, uh, deploying it to the cluster. And we have the logs here. Uh, but we could also just go inside of the control plane and uh, do a kubectl get pods and see those containers are being created. So this is a great way to test things out on a local Kubernetes instance before I take things to production. Um, and we'll see that as these containers are waiting to be pulled, what I could do is just push them locally to this uh, kind cluster. So I have the ability to do so here from the images to push them uh, as I would do from the CLI, but now from this GUI, uh, which is a lot easier. So now it won't have to pull down these images. It's going to have them in the local registry. Uh, store as well. So if I go back here, I think we should be able to see uh, that they're running. Perfect. I open this up, and we've got our new application with an ingress that we can see in this lovely little Kubernetes instance. Um, so it's really nice to be able to test things out. Uh, but since I'm short on time, let me show you the next stage, which if I've done some testing and I've seen how things work in this Kubernetes instance, I can create a completely free OpenShift cluster. Um, for 30 days, there's 14 gigabytes of RAM and there's uh, 40 gigabytes of storage. Um, not for mining Bitcoin, unfortunately, even though the, the price is really good right now. Um, but this allows us to set up a free OpenShift sandbox to deploy our application. I've already connected to it here. I've got this uh, devconf um, profile uh, in my kube config. And I just go back to the pods and just can deploy it there. And you'll notice it's automatically going to create the OpenShift route. Uh, so that we don't have to do any uh, other extra configuration in order to access our application based on the port that's being exposed. Um, so we'll wait for those containers to create. And just like that, I've got this application running 
Uh, I could share this with other people. I could let people see what I'm doing with my application. Uh, and this is all in this OpenShift cluster here uh, where we can start working with it. And that's super nice. Um, so what I'm going to do is run one more container. And so you guys can check this out, uh, which is a QR code generator. So I'll start this. And this is a simple application to uh, generate QR code based on, oh, that's not the right URL. Let me come back over to the pods. Uh, I can see it's running in Podman Desktop. And this actually brings me to another really cool part is this Kubernetes UI. This is pretty new in the past, um, say, few months. It allows us to see our different ingresses and routes. So we've got this devconf pod. And I can just open up the URL to see this application again. Um, and I'll generate a QR code. So if you want to test out and get some handy links for Podman Desktop, uh, feel free to scan this uh, little QR code um, and see the application that we just built from our local environment. We translated that into a pod, uh, tested it locally, and then deployed it to Kubernetes. Um, and so that's a f really kind of simple way to explain how Podman Desktop really streamlines the application development workflow if you're targeting Kubernetes, no matter what type of flavor or version whether it's Kubernetes uh, or if it's a distro like um, uh, OpenShift. So uh, the next part I want to show you um, is uh, the kind of stack. So we worked with uh, Electron, same as Slack and VS Code, as well as Svelte to build the application. Uh, so no matter if you're on Windows, Mac, or Linux, as containers or Linux, you can use Podman Desktop. Um, but I quickly want to kind of rewind just a little bit. Was anyone at the talk in E105 where they were mentioning Instruct Lab and the way to uh, build open source models from scratch? OK, sweet. So Instruct Lab is a way to fine tune, um, essentially, a, a model that we might have. So this brings me to this really cool extension called Podman AI Lab. Um, Podman AI Lab is a way to get started working with generative AI locally. Uh, you've got these sample recipes that I need to make a little bit bigger allow you to get set up with uh, demo applications. You can uh, see those from a catalog of different uh, models. So if you've used Mistral or Llama before, you can work with those here. Um, and you can run these as services and playground environments as well. I'll, I'll show you a quick one before we hop into uh, how to actually um, integrate AI into, a new or into an existing application. Uh, but what this does is it uses the power of containers for the, s the same way that we've done for applications and databases, now for AI models and AI-enabled applications. Um, and so I'll, rec I'll restart this one more time just so I can see all of the logs that are happening here. Um, essentially, we've got, uh, has anyone here used Olama before, perhaps? Perfect. OK, sweet. So in the same way that Olama works, uh, it, we're working with an open source project called Llama C++. This is an inference server based on C++ for working with different types of models. Um, so we've uh, built a server, and we have that mounted to a, a model, a GGUF quantized model, such as Llama or such as Mistral, or one of these really cool open source models that you can use without paying and knowing and you're able to know where your data is so it's not getting leaked out like the crazy stories that we've seen. Uh, and we have a Streamlit app that's also been built. So both of these are containers. I'll show you these in a second. Um, but we can essentially start up really easily uh, an AI-enabled application. So for example, um, uh, I've got one to kind of summarize some release notes for Podman Desktop. Uh, and you can see this from the actual source code in, our app, in uh, this recipe. So actually, let me make this a little bit bigger. Uh, if I go up here, it clones these recipes which if you're interested in the recipes, talk to Sally. She is a uh, big helper and contributor to that project. Uh, for this app, for example, it's a summarizer. So uh, we're connecting to a model endpoint uh, that we have served on port 8001. Uh, and we're essentially uh, loading in a file, so a PDF or a text file, chunking that, uh, and sending that to the model with a prompt template. So um, let me comment out that one. This one is produce a brilliant final summary. Uh, I use this for a different example. Feel free to ignore it. But we essentially process those chunks and send that to the model uh, and get a, a summary back. So for example, this one, um, we're talking to the model and asking it to summarize. In this release, we have significant enhancements to Podman. This is before Podman version 5. My apologies. Uh, and so we can build a simple application like this in a container, just like we did with that, uh, that first application, the hit counter, uh, and use a model. 
Uh, but you guys have probably seen a lot of different examples of chatbots. Uh, and I want to show you um, a cool use case for uh, model serving that's built on this Instruct Lab project. Uh, if you haven't heard of it before, Instruct Lab is a really cool way to um, essentially fine tune a model. So uh, based on a project between Red Hat and IBM, uh, we've found a, a, a really cool new way to be able to train and fine tune models uh, based on um, this lab technique. So you can contribute new skills and knowledge. That knowledge is then uh, generated uh, with new synthetic training data and passed back into the model uh, so that you have a new GGUF file that you can take to Hugging Face or you can deploy uh, locally or on the cloud. And applications can take advantage of that just like they did in the summarizer one. Um, so this is a really cool new project. And I want to show you it in action. You can check out the CLI on GitHub. Um, but you have the ability to serve a model, like Olama serve, uh, download a model, but also to generate new training data to train a model. So I've done that. And the training data that I want to show you uh, is right here in VS Code for, um, for a, a McLaren. So how many of us watched Back to the Future growing up? All right, fantastic. The, the DeLorean is a real car. The flux capacitor doesn't exist. We're going to train this model to know what a flux capacitor is by uh, working with a question and answer pair uh, YAML file that we have here. Uh, so we have question and answer pairs like, when was the DeLorean manufactured? Uh, more information is in this repository, which contains the cost of a flux capacitor, let's say $10 million. Uh, and I've trained the data with all this synthetic training data uh, that it's creating. Uh, and then this gets passed in, trained with the model. Uh, so that we can generate a GGUF quantized version of this model. I'm not a data scientist. I'm explaining this briefly. Um, and we've got this new trained uh, Instruct Lab model based on Merlinite, which is a derivative of Mistral. Uh, and so all I have to do is serve this model. Well, first I'll import it um, so I can add it as a GGUF model. Uh, I'll navigate to where I did my training. And this was right before the session started, so I'm glad uh, that this finished up. New Merlinite. I'll import this model. We can see this here. I'll start it as a service. So I'll be able to uh, query it just like any other API that I'm used to working with. Um, and we've got this new service in order to see the server and be able to work with example code, for example, Java and LinkChain. So I've got this, port, this connection here to a model. It's being served in a container. Uh, we can view that with Llama C++. Um, and we'll go ahead and show you here is that by opening up a new project, this is the last demo that I'll show, um, we've got a, a Quarkus application with a Langchain. You might have seen the Langchain talk yesterday here, which was really cool. Uh, and I'll go ahead and do a Quarkus run so you can see this application. Um, so Quarkus run. Oh, no, sorry, Quarkus dev. See, it? I'm not a Java developer. Um, but what I can show you is that we've got a connection to the model in our application.properties to that port 8,000. Uh, and so we're going to build this application or run this application really quickly. We've passed in the temperature of the model, so how definite we want it to be, uh, and the name as well. And so I'll go ahead and open this up in um, my browser, 8,005. And we'll give it a second to finish up here. So we've got this nice insurance application. Uh, and what I'll show you is that, well, we've got a new claim from Marty McFly. He had an accident. Looks like the DeLorean is a little bit messed up. That's OK. Uh, and what we can do is use this chatbot with the new information that we've trained in that model. So how much is a replacement flux capacitor? And I'll ask that model. And we'll see that in LangChain, we've kind of passed on and abstracted the complexities of working with a model and asked this to the model so that here in a second, uh, we'll be able to see the response based on that trained model. Now, Mistral never, knows, never knew how much uh, a flux capacitor would cost. Um, but because of this new training technique that's really cool, uh, we can train the model this new information. Um, and fortunately, hopefully in the last two seconds here, because I'm out of time, um, we'll be able to get the response back from the model. Uh, this is the first time I've ran this. Uh, but so the cost of a replacement flux capacitor is $10 million. The model doesn't know this. We trained it. And that's a really cool part of this project. So I want to recap. You know what's next for Podman. Uh, there's a lot going on uh, that you can check out on the repository. Uh, that is that new Podman machine rebuild. That was really cool. And Podman Desktop. But I highly encourage you to try it out. Get started with Podman Desktop today. 
get involved in the, in the community. Uh, and if you want to see the slides and resources for the demo that I did today, feel free to check it out. But thank you so much. I'll be here if you have any questions. And thank you for your time. <laughs> thank you.